Hi everyone, and welcome to the Week 2 Supplemental Lecture on Bruno Latour's We Have Never Been Modern. This piece starts in a very accessible way. Uh, it starts by talking about things you might see in the newspaper. And what Latour is after with this starting point is to say that the things that you see in the newspaper often transcend or cross over the boundaries that we establish within universities um, that we use to divide up the, our knowledge into categories. And Latour is going to say that these categories are not very well suited to deal with everyday aspects of our experience, like the aspects of the experience that we see when we open up the paper. So he starts off and he says, one of the things that you see in the paper is analysis that is far more global, that has actors that are scattered well apart from each other geographically, people who may not know each other, and people who are interacting not only with other people, but with things that we might think of as objects in the natural world. He says, on page 12, the Pope, French bishops, Monsanto, the fallopian tubes, and Texas fundamentalists gather in a strange cohort around a single contraceptive. Okay, so just in this one sentence, you've got very formal traditional actors like the Pope, you've got formal traditional bodies like French bishops, you've got Texas fundamentalists who are on the other side of the world and who are part of something like a social movement, you've got Monsanto, which is a very modern artificial person, a corporation, and then you've got the fallopian tubes, which we think of as natural body parts. And Latour is saying, here are all of these things blended together, and the elements of this have very little in common. If you were looking at a traditional academic discipline, you might have a different discipline studying each of these objects. And yet, as part of our everyday, we don't really have any problem making sense of this. If I'm reading an article and it's got all of these different actors in it, it doesn't confuse me. I'm used to navigating that sort of space as part of my everyday life. Okay, so first he says that there's part of us that tends to engage in practices where the practices themselves cut across traditional academic boundaries. And if we're going to analyze these practices that cut across these boundaries, maybe we need a different kind of practice academically. He talks about the degree to which newspaper stories talk about crisis and danger and about uncertainty. We're uncertain what requires action or how to act. And a lot of the crises that come up in the newspapers today, Latour says, are not purely social crises. They're not purely natural crises. They're about the intersection of these two things. So they're about phenomena that are not easily categorized as one thing or the other and that span traditional academic disciplines. He says, those hybrid articles that sketch out the imbroglios of science, politics, economy, law, religion, technology, fiction, okay, these are all things where you have their own academic specializations. Latour says, if reading the daily paper is modern man's form of prayer, then it is a very strange man indeed who is doing the praying today while reading about these mixed up affairs. All of culture and all of nature get churned up again every day. So Latour is saying, it is part of our everyday practice that we think across these traditional academic boundaries. He's trying to suggest that STS also thinks across these traditional academic boundaries, but that this confuses people who work within the traditional disciplines. So he says science and technology studies is under a great deal of pressure to conform to traditional disciplinary boundaries and to categorize its work, to declare what it is doing as either pertaining to the natural world, the social world, or the world of culture. He uses the terms naturalization, socialization, and deconstruction as his shorthand. And he says this isn't going to work. STS cannot declare which of these three areas it fits into because it is pursuing objects of study that run through these areas. So these boundaries do not apply to the subject matter of science and technology studies. The problem, he says, is that when it's looked at from the standpoint of a traditional discipline, STS tends to look reductionist. It doesn't look like it's trying to look at all three of these social spheres. There is a fear that it is trying to reduce phenomena to only one of those social spheres. Okay, now reductionism is something that's going to come up in the course in a number of different ways. You can reduce everything to the natural world. So someone can say, for example, that you don't really have emotions or feelings, that really all that's going on are chemical processes in your body 
that would be a reduction of the phenomenon of emotions to what is perceived to be an underlying, more true, more fundamental reality, which is chemical processes. Okay? And you'll sometimes see that kind of argument in neuroscience, in biology. STS is understood often by its critics as reducing things to the social or to the cultural. So the fear with STS is it is talking about science, it is talking about the study of the natural world, and it is also talking about social and cultural phenomena, and it's talking about science as a social and cultural phenomena. And critics get very scared that what it's going to do is reduce these phenomena so that we lose our ability to talk about objective truths and we lose our ability to talk about the truth value of science. So this is the thing people are scared of with science technology studies. Latour says, if the creatures we are pursuing cross all three spaces, we're no longer understood. Okay, so people are confused. They think STS is doing something Latour doesn't think it's doing. They are misrecognizing the nature of its object, and this causes opposition. And then he talks about anthropology. Now the story he tells about anthropology is sort of like another side of the story that Connell from week one tells about sociology. So Connell tells this story that sociology used to have a lot of people in it as a discipline, um, or really in some ways before it became a formal modern academic discipline. There were a lot of people writing sociologically who were really interested in the non-modern. And yet, when it gets institutionalized as an academic discipline, particularly in the U.S., Connell argues, those people interested in the non-modern are excluded from the discipline, and the discipline defines itself as being about the problems of the industrial core. Latour is telling that same story here, but he's telling it from the standpoint of what happens to some of those people who suddenly find themselves outside sociology at that point. So if you are interested in the non-modern and you're interested in the past, you probably go and end up in a history department somewhere. If you're interested in the non-modern in the present, you define yourself as an anthropologist. And anthropologists apply particular methods to the study of societies that are perceived not to be modern. Latour suggests that we need to take these tools, these anthropological forms of analyses, and apply them to our own modern societies and to that most modern aspect of our societies, its science and technology. And Latour says there is a perception that we cannot do this because modern societies are perceived to be too complex and too differentiated. And what Latour has in mind here is a particular narrative that dates back in many ways to classical liberalism, and we'll take a look at it in that context next week. But there is a narrative that what the modern is about, what modernity is about, is a differentiation, a clear differentiation between the natural and the social worlds. So the natural world comes to be perceived as a world of objects that doesn't intrinsically have anything to do with humans, that is governed by its own natural laws that humans can discover, but that we don't constitute. And it's understood as a disenchanted world, a material world, that is separate from our social and our political institutions, which are historical and more contingent and more arbitrary. Okay, this is a very fundamental distinction. And anthropology for Latour takes that distinction and looking at other societies that don't perceive nature in the same way, says, well, those societies are just kind of wrong. Nature really is this disenchanted material space. And other societies that don't think of nature that way are just projecting human values onto nature. Now, I should say that anthropology today doesn't particularly do this, but Latour has got in mind a particular earlier tradition. STS tries to argue that that particular material conception of the natural world is itself a social and cultural artifact. And this makes a lot of people very annoyed. Okay? It concerns people. It seems like it might undermine the truth claims of the sciences if we start suggesting that there's some way in which our material conception, our materialist conception of the natural world isn't right, is itself a contingent historical product. Uh, people get fears of relativism with this form of analysis, and that's something that will come up again and again. Latour says that we can do this. This is one of the central claims of the group of people that he's part of. But he says it means something interesting that we can. 
the distinction between the natural world and the social world is so fundamental to the modern that once we start saying we can do an anthropological analysis of that distinction, okay, this very foundational distinction of modernity, we're going to need to define what it means to be modern. Okay, what does it mean to be modern when we don't just take for granted this distinction between the natural and the social, uh, but when we are trying to understand how that distinction comes about? And he says, look, it's not an accident that we're able to ask these kinds of questions now. STS is very consistent that if people are thinking in new ways and in ways that we perceive as more intuitive now, more correct now, that we cannot explain the emergence of these new forms of thinking by pointing to their correctness. We can't say, well, this idea has just occurred to us because it's right. What we have to do is figure out what's changed in our social practices, in our cultural environment that has made it easier for us to think about problems in a certain way, to ask certain kinds of questions, to think of doing certain kinds of answers. Okay, so if he, Latour, and the group of people he's with are saying we can apply anthropological insights to modern societies, and if that's a new thing to do, it implies to him that something's changed about society itself. So what's changed? He has a section on 1989, and superficially this is kind of weird, because Latour himself has been writing for decades before 1989. But 1989 is one of these watershed years, and you'll find it used as a shorthand in many of the texts that we're going to read this term, because it's one of these moments where events that were steadily building over the course of several decades suddenly erupt, and you get very, very dramatic, rapid change. So Latour is using 1989 to mark a particular era, uh, and it's the date that people pin the collapse of the Soviet Union on. So it ends the world, the 20th century period where you've got this great Cold War that divides the world up between the Communist East uh, and the Capitalist West. And it is initially declared by many, many people, some of whom we'll read later in the term, as a marker of the historical triumph of liberalism. Okay, and again, next week, we'll look a little bit more closely about what liberalism is and what it means. But Latour says this triumph was short-lived. And the reason that it was short-lived is that immediately what comes to the fore is a great consciousness of global crises of different sorts. And these global crises have a particular characteristic. They are bound up with the relationship of society to nature. And he's got in mind things like global warming, population crises, resource, resource shortages, fears over pandemics. Okay, so these are all crises that don't sit neatly in the natural world or in the social world, but that have to do with the interaction of the two. He is suggesting that the emergence of these kinds of phenomena as sort of part of our daily diet in the news prime the kinds of analyses that are being carried out in STS. So he says here they shake confidence in liberalism. And one of the things that happens when that confidence is shaken is postmodernism arises, he says, as a symptom. And he describes postmodernism in a very interesting way. He says postmodernism expresses an incomplete skepticism. Now, we'll take a look at some both adherents and critics of postmodernism as we go into later weeks. Critics of it don't think of it as an incomplete skepticism. They often think of it as a very thoroughgoing skepticism and worry that it's undermining our ability to make truth claims or moral judgments, to talk about what's true and what's right. Uh, Latour doesn't view it that way. He says postmodernism is a symptom that arises because we are unable now to believe the promises of socialism and what he calls naturalism, where naturalism is this disenchanted, very secular conception of the material world that he thinks drives modern science. Okay, so we've got crises that have come about because of the forms of technology and the forms of science that have come out of that kind of naturalism. And Latour thinks those are in, implicated in the sorts of crises that we're now dealing with today. Uh, and socialism, we have the experience of the Soviet Union to make us worried what happens if we follow a traditional socialist project. So both of these grand projects for Latour have become a little dubious and become something we are guarded about. <coughs> 
At the same time, it's not a complete rejection. He says we're careful not to reject them totally, or postmodernists are careful not to reject them totally. So he does not agree that this is complete skepticism. It's not nihilism. It's not throwing everything out uh, and going with whoever is the strongest person in the fight. We are suspended, he says, between belief and doubt. Okay, so we can no longer believe in these projects, but we're no longer completely rejecting of them either. And then he acknowledges that there are critics, there are people who reject postmodernism, and he's very dismissive of these people. He says, they decide to carry on as if nothing had changed. They decide to remain resolutely modern. Okay, and he's critical of this. This is not a compliment that they remain resolutely modern. So what does modernity mean? He reflects on that. And he says the concept makes no sense unless you contrast it with some kind of image of an archaic, stable past. That past may not have ever existed, but it is the image that comes up when you talk about the modern. What is the modern in contrast to? It's in contrast to the ancients. And there are people who think the ancients have a better way of life, and there are people who think the moderns do. But there's a break in time that's implicated in the concept of modernity between modernity and what was before it. And he says this break is associated with a break between human and non-human worlds. So modernity's defining characteristic for Latour is that we come up with this very secular, what in other readings we call disenchanted, understanding of material nature as an object world outside us. And we don't perceive that understanding of the material world to itself be a, an arbitrary cultural or a contingent historical human product. So what does it mean to be modern now? Like many of the people that you can read this week, Latour says that being modern now implies a commitment to a critical project. And that critical project has two characteristic practices. And Latour thinks it has always had these two characteristic practices. It's just that it hasn't always known that it has. It's not always been conscious of this characteristic. So the critical project involves, on the one hand, a translation between different kinds of beings, and on the other hand, a purification of the boundary between human and non-human. And these are somewhat contradictory. So on the one hand, there's a great deal of hybridity, there's a tendency in the project of modernity to blur old boundaries, to undermine old boundaries. But on the other hand, there's a very, very sharp, stark enforcement of a particular boundary between the human and the non-human. And Latour says we have to do both these things simultaneously to be modern now. We have to blur and undermine and hybridize boundaries, and we have to maintain them at the same time. But there's a difference. Something's changed. Latour is able, and the people that he works with are able, to say this, to characterize modernity in this way. But he does not believe this is how it always would have been characterized. So something has changed to make us reflexively aware that these are the practices that we need to engage in if we're going to be modern, and that these are the practices that people have engaged in, whether they were aware of it or not, when they were modern. And he says, once we come to this realization, our past begins to change. And this is one of these kinds of comments that absolutely drives critics of this kind of movement nuts. What do you mean our past begins to change? The past is past, it is dead, it is dusted, it is gone. That's it. You can't change the past. Latour would say, you were thinking of the past as an object. There is an object back there, there's stuff that happened, but the past is our relationship to that object, and our relationship to that object can certainly change. And when it changes, we notice different aspects of the object, we interact with the object in different ways, and this is what I'm talking about, and this is what STS is talking about, and this is what it's talking about when it talks about our relationship with the natural world as well. When our relationship with the past changes, when we realize that being modern involves these practices, and also that in the past people didn't realize it involved these practices, we learn, he says, that we have never been modern. Okay, it's a provocative statement. And he says that this opens up new possibilities beyond current debates over relativism, ideology, etc. So these are the things that STS is accused of. 
It's accused by some of its critics of being relativist. Some of its adherents even describe themselves as relativist, so it's not a completely baseless charge. Latour thinks you can move past these kinds of debates, at least in this piece. We'll take a look at some other Latour in a few weeks where he's a little more uncertain, where he's a little bit worried about the role that STS might have played in providing unintentional support for other kinds of skepticism, where he's worried about things like movements that are anti-science around environmental crisis. Okay, so watch this space. <laughs>